All right, this is Big Boss of Foxtown Woods Ball. Come to you from Fort Lauderdale and from my blog page over at outerheavenpaintball.blogspot.com. I'm also repping the guys from Acid Tactical, so you can check them out at acidtactical.com. Anyway, for this particular video, we're going to be discussing urban warfare. Mount, military operations on urban terrain. This is the kind of stuff that is becoming the big thing. It's been the big thing for the past two decades with our operations in Afghanistan, but more notably in Iraq because of all the major cities that were built up. We're talking notably stuff like the Battle of Ramadi, Battle of Najaf, Battle of Fallujah, which was both Operations Vigilant Resolve and Operation Phantom Fury. And even to some extent, we'll be discussing some of the urban battles of history, such as Stalingrad, Way City, and others. But I also want to focus on the tactics because there's a caveat to doing urban operations. But before we get to that, Let's have a word from our friends and sponsors over at Acid Tactical. You can check them out over at acidtactical.com. And remember, when the shit hits the fan and you've got to trust your gear with your life, ask yourself this one question. Can your gear survive the acid test? We'll be back right after this. Urban environments are probably the most adrenaline pumping experiences a paintball player could deal with. Looking at actual military history, you can look at places like the battles of Fallujah, Way City, Stalingrad, and you will understand why the urban battlefield is probably the most intensive and the most insane places to fight in. With that being said, for all of us that are tactical paintball players, we're going to have to learn to move, shoot, and communicate in these kind of environments. For all of us that run teams and be able to coordinate as a team to take the buildings or to move in and out of these places, it requires a whole different place. Okay, we're back, and hopefully that little history lesson was a good one. We'll be discussing a lot more of that as far as a few things go down the line. But 
Ah, oh, shit. I'm probably wearing the wrong setup for this one because we're talking urban, we're talking cities, yeah. Generally speaking, you know, wear the camo pattern of, of the environment you're in before you hit the city, so this could vary, but let's get into what could be more urban-esque. So let me snap this one in. Wow, okay. Haven't done that in a while. Now, yeah, this went from the woodland to the army-issued UCPs. This dumpster fire of a camo pattern, though I like it still if I'm doing urban areas, walk on. So, with that being said, that's essentially what we're getting into. So, when we discuss the urban battlefield, we are discussing things like alleyways, we're discussing roadways, we're discussing anything and everything built up over. X amount of years, and if history is any judge, it is a nightmare in itself because there are so many places where opposing combatants could hide. Any place could become a veritable death trap of sorts. It's like any stretch of road could be a sniper's wet dream come true. Any turn in the road could be a choke point anything and everything and this is for anybody who understands their environment that they're operating in they will have that knowledge of the environment and they will have a greater tactical advantage over their opponents paintball is a little more nuanced than that especially because a lot of players are going to new fields. The fields are going to be changing things up every once in a while to keep things fresh and exciting. That way, regular players won't exactly have that much of a working knowledge of the place after it's been renovated or worked around every once in a while. But for those players that are new to the area, it's going to be a daunting task. So with that being said, we're going to be discussing some tactical situations as far as certain ambush things, how elevated structures could be hazardous to your team if you're dealing with certain player styles, but we're also going to be working around equipment and markers for how to deal with this environment, so we'll be right back. Okay, let's talk markers for a minute because depending upon what your team position is and your responsibilities on that team, if you're running an organized Milsim style team, you could run the gambit on anything from a compact PDW style up all the way up to a big time sniper setup with the first strike capability that could reach out and touch somebody, but general purpose, if you're going for something more like what, actual infantry or special operations types would be where set it up as, this would be a good example. This one is my Tiffin X7, with, built on the Takamo MK7 bag fed kit. Full custom setup on the forearm, 14 inch, Lapco Big Shot Assault Barrel means I could put a mock suppressor on here to make it even more badass looking, but it stretches it out a bit. Retractable six position stock. This is a genuine article that is used by actual AR-15 guys, so there is that. Now, the MagFed markers are going to have an excellent advantage in, in any urban or close quarters battle setup, especially because they can shoot at extreme angles like an actual firearm. All your paint is going to be held in the magazine rather than having it in the hopper. So with that being said, you've got more options as far as reloads. You got a faster reload time. You got more options going between your standard 20 shot capacity magazines. You've got options for your 
big box mags that are on the market these days so these tactical markers now can keep up with tournament guns pretty damn easily and definitely could keep up with the hopper fed guys and this setup I would say this is around your carbine rifle setups easy to maneuver you've got more grip purchase on the gun and you've got more space to mount accessories you're not crunched in like you would be with a tournament gun you can actually get it out to various shooting positions and make sure have the capability to mount specific things such as tack lights lasers you got sight options that is good for any good urban slash CQB setup. Now, what if we're still fairly new to paintball? We haven't made the jump to MagFed or the more tactical, yet you still want to have a tactical style marker. Well, a good marker on that would be this one, another one of my personals. This one is a Tiffman A5 put a brand new body kit on here I'm still rocking the old BT three position R15 stock on here because I like it it's still badass so I could probably find better ones on the market to fit the MP5 aesthetic foam magazine and flatline barrel too the flatline is a good thing it stretches your practical range out a little bit this would be nice maneuverable you could get this thing compact essentially this is designed around the premise of the Heckler Hawk MP5 case of machine guns so that being said this would be one of those kind that you would want for a PDW or true CQB setup if you need optimal maneuverability only downside is the hopper setup because this is on a cyclone feed You've still got that little piece sticking out, but the profile is more minimal than any of the tournament style guns that you'd find out there. So something like this would be more compact, more suitable for tighter environments. So this one, definitely a home run setup. You have the ability to reach out and touch somebody. You got the firepower capability. So definitely a true machine gun in that sense especially if you're rocking a response trigger or an electronic trigger either way last but not least we're jumping back into the magfed category pistols this one tipping tpx seven shot capacity for standard magazine so you can get 12 to 20 round zeta mags definitely a good pistol to have if you're the type of player to rock a secondary marker on you in the field especially for urban environments if your primary marker like this one here is too bulky cumbersome you run out of paint or you got to get into a tight space you want to have a backup plan so that is where the pistol is the most appropriate for your situation and this one is naked, meaning I have not done any kind of modification to it. I haven't even put a tactical light on here, though. That would be good practice for any players to have a tactical light on their pistol and on your primary. We'll be discussing tactical light etiquette down the line in this video. But long story short, your pistol is going to be your backup, but it can end up as your primary if you run into those situations that I did mention. With that being said, depending upon your setups, having this mounted on a chest holster, mounted holster to your, on your rig, a shoulder option, or hip drop leg, that is going to be personal preference. However, it should also be practiced with if you're looking to do more urban and close quarters games that way you know how your gear is going to work with you when you got to make those dynamic entries into the room 
and we're going to be looking at a few other fun little items. Okay, let's talk about one of your bare basic setups. This shit right here. Your typical Alice rig. Web gear. It's pretty much minimalistic. This is the stuff that has been uh, standard for armies the world over for generations. At least from the early 1900s right on into even more recent times. Oh, it's even making a comeback in some areas too, but regardless, you got everything laid out as far on a belt, you got your pouches, you got your hydration, or you could, instead of having two canteens, have one air tank, and a butt pack as the centerpiece, all held with an H or a Y harness. Some harnesses have an X setup. Now, with that being said, this kit is okay. However, it's bulky around your hips. And if you've got to move fast, you do not want anything like a butt pack getting in the way. Or you don't want to have unnecessary equipment on some things. So, we're going to be showing uh, another alternative. However, this gear is still serviceable for urban operations. Maybe not so much in close quarters, but definitely a solid general purpose the concept was proven by marines during the battle of way city so let's move on from there okay got my h harness set up on now cool thing about this i did review on it a couple years ago this is design was actually standard issue to the united states air force but i found this in a army acu went to town on it you have versions like this made by Eagle Industries as well as others, so you can check those out too, but long story short, this is pretty much my ACU Urban Warfare loadout. i am pretty much got my magazines up front, though if I wanted to swap over the hopper fed, I've got that capability. I'm thinking about switching the pouches out, but haven't decided yet. Overall, this is set up as if I was going to go into an actual combat situation. Mags up front, because I'm a left-handed shooter, I'm going to be doing the majority of my reloads from my right side as opposed to my left, but I'm set up to still have access to my ammo from the left in the event I need to take ammo off this side to reload my gun or move it over from this side to this side but I digress, I'd move on. I've got a GP pouch here. I could toss a couple extra pods in here for reloading my magazines. I could carry an IFAC in here. That's the reason why I carry this pouch over here. If I was running a 203 or a handheld launcher, I got my ammo pouches here for the 203 shells. And on the back, It'd be my camelback and my air tank because I'm running a remote line is a good thing in these kind of environments but still same rules apply to be careful on that one however long story short everything is distributed nice and even Leon here that is the biggest thing you got to consider when you're running a urban style loadout is how well is your gear set up? Are we running bulked out? Are we going low profile? Are we going general purpose? That's one thing you and your team are going to have to look at. However, this is all going to be subjective based on your position within that team, what your responsibilities are. Are we doing a team leader? Are we a sniper, machine gun? These are things that we need to consider, but Long story short, everything on here is going to be set up for your tactical situation. 
Now with that being said, let's swap over to a more semi-modern Op4 style loadout. Give me one moment. Okay, another good setup is this one. This one is kind of inspired like an Op4 rig with a little bit of American kit. Kind of what you'd see with like CIA ground branch, i.e. their special activities or paramilitary guys. Wearing a fucking JICOM chest rig. This chest rig would be a good idea for a low profile setup. Especially if you're the kind of guy that needs to move fast. And with a minimum amount of gear, this chest rig is going to be your best bet. you got enough room in the grenade pouches to get a small radio system on here so you're good you can throw your sustainment or extra paint a tank on a belt no need for water you're good to go but as you can see i got my ammo up here mainly though i could easily get to it get that mag pull get this thing out if i need to and get this into the gun but Aside from that, re-indexing these things is a bit of a nightmare, so I would say definitely have a dump pouch ready for this particular setup, though. I've got one right here for my speed reload. Get that in the gun and get that back into a fight because the ACU pouch I've got here is not set up well for magazines or pods at that point, but as you can see, Fully kitted out. I've got what would be my GP slash IFAC here. I've got magazines over here. I've got the provisions for running my air tank on a remote line here. I can easily get to it. And I'm rocking my backup pistol. Pistols are going to be a good thing, especially for close quarters games. Especially with the urban environment the way it is, you want your backups, but that's either here nor there on most setups, depending on what we're doing, but with that being said, this is kind of gear stuff that you'd want to look at. Tactical vests, anything, it doesn't really matter so long as it's low profile, it works for you, you can get in and out of places with it especially tight places so with that being said let's move on depending upon your team and your operational setup or what kind of game you're doing you may want to opt for more non-tactical clothing i.e. civilian attire you can be semi-tactical with the cargo pants but other than that Blue jeans would be just fine, and anything like that gives you more of a gray man style if you're looking for something that isn't completely tactical or military. Okay, here's a tactical scenario that's about to go down. This is from the HBO miniseries Generation Kill. Guys, first recon with their embed reporter just come under fire from a sniper. What they have to do is take cover, which is what they're doing. One guy's explaining to the reporter what's going on as far as the bullet behavior when they're being shot at by a sniper. And now they're about to do what's called bounding movement. As you can see, one Marine's running to cover, and one Marine is providing cover. Look for a the sniper hoping for a muzzle flash so that way they can engage as they bound back to a more defensible position while they're watching for muzzle flash from a sniper that way they can engage them if they see them but they're taking turns running here's where the reporter kind of makes an ass out of himself as you can see he's running in a zigzag pattern while the sniper's trying to engage him, the Marines are looking at him like a what the fuck situation. So, with that being said, you can see why it pays to run in a straight line. Reporter, what the fuck? 
fuck was that? Serpentine shell, serpentine. You know, the movie, The In-Laws. Peter Falk tells Alan Arkin, always oh, run in a serpentine fashion. I was running evasively. Next time we come under fire, run in a straight line, you'll live longer. And have a full, happy life of betraying us and others with your vena lies. <laughs> what you're watching is a urban warfare exercise that was from a documentary on U.S. Navy SEALs made in the late 90s up until 2000 at least. However, everything shown here is a accurate depiction of what they did at the time as well as what we as paintball players can do as far as our own urban tactical movements. Now, as you can see, you're watching in the alleyways to make sure that there's no ambush point. However, as the team progresses through the city, they're also watching for anything that could indicate an ambush or some kind of a trap. That means the windows on the upper floors or the rooftops. For that particular reason, if the enemy is hiding in the rooftops or on upper story windows they could easily have a more commanding view of the area as well as see anything moving on the ground i.e. that seal platoon with that being said their options for attack could be anything from tossing down hand grenades opening up on them from an elevated position with a machine gun nest snipers or an RPG team now, as the units progress and they want to move in, they're securing their doorways, watching those areas. But, as you see, when they come down the corners, they're going to present the weapon out so that way they could engage if they run into uh, immediate action. But other than that, everyone is keeping their head on a swivel. They're not looking anywhere where that weapon isn't pointed. This is a thing that they've had to do based on the prior experiences during Operation Gothic Serpent in Somalia in 93. Now, here's where things start getting crazy. Contact is made. One guy's already in the line of fire. He's got to go. The other guy behind him opens up with his weapon, provides support by fire so that way they can evacuate. Each team member is going to be moving in a leapfrog fashion. One guy goes, runs back, the guy behind them immediately steps up, lays down cover fire, and egresses backward toward a safer area while the rest of the team that's behind them are following suit. The point is to lay down a barrage of firepower to make sure that the enemy cannot truly engage as well as provide cover fire for that guy to get out of there. Okay, for those joining us, drew this a couple years back for a earlier video on this matter, but moving on. This is pretty much a basic setup, hallways, doorways, basic kind of structure. Now, here's going to be your setup, taking the building. These three red dots are the op four. They need to go. The blue dots here are you. You're the assault team. Now keep this in mind doorways windows always keep an eye on those when you're making your approach to the building that way you can engage targets you stack up at the door you begin your breach right then and there now you can do it in an assault style or in a soft breach which is you're moving quietly if you're going full breach means you're assaulting in there every room you guys stack up on you're throwing distraction devices or you're just kicking in that door and going in and shooting anything that moves now 
For this one, we're doing a little more of a soft breach type deal. We're at the door. Now, this isn't exactly perfect in representation, but it works. Now, two guys in the rear are going to be your rear security in the event that other bad guys may be coming in. You stack up on the door. Now, the doorways are going to be the more dangerous aspect of a breach. Doorways are called the fatal funnel for a damn good reason. If you guys get caught up in that doorway or you stop because your primary goes down or anything, you guys are screwed. The thing is, this is fast, aggressive movement. This is violence of action in its purest form. Meaning, you get that door open, you throw in your distraction device. When taking the room, you guys are going to move along the wall. Now, it's going to work like this. Every first and third person will move to the left, second and fourth to the right. Switch it up as you like. Use what works for you on this one. But, long story short, it's got to be fast, it's got to be violent. Now, as you're going to watch in a second, move in, you shoot your guys, y'all take the place easy as one, two, and three. Now, here's another one we're dealing with. This is multiple entryways, or what's called a synchronized breach, meaning second you breach the room two different entrances to that specific room this one is definitely requiring timing and good coordination so that way you avoid friendly fire incidents because in some games depending upon your rules if you shoot out a teammate that's as good as shooting somebody out in real life now set up two guys on security room's got three enemy combatants two guys stack up on one door two guys stack up on another now with that being said same rules apply however in this case either door can initiate the initial breach by opening it and throwing in a distraction device or both do it simultaneously either way the second that distraction device goes off or the room opens up, it's going to be a fucking melee in there. So keep your heads on swivel as you move in, two in the corner, two move along the walls, you wipe out the opposition. That's pretty much how you do it. Now, the real problem here is if you have to exercise target discrimination, meaning hostages that are in the game or sensitive materials that can't be shot so check your fire constantly when you're doing this and try not to sweep into the marker weapon or anything like that of a teammate overwatch is an important thing for any kind of operation in urban environments as you can see Gary assigned security in this footage so that way he's covering the door while he gets to work doing what he does for an overwatch or a sniping position in urban terrain you're pretty much covering your own team while you're looking for targets of opportunity that are outside and firing from concealed position in an urban environment is a lot harder to track okay as you see from this particular scene these guys did the dumbest thing ever. Now, I know they don't have night vision goggles, but the dumbest thing any team can do in this particular scenario is all of them turning on their weapon-mounted lights. This not only will give away their position, but it broadcasts to the enemy that there's multiple guys coming up at the same time. Now, if you have to use a weapon-mounted light under darkness or low light conditions the only guy that should ever have their weapon mounted light on is the point man unless the team breaks off into smaller two or three man fire teams okay that's going to conclude our video on 
tactical urban paintball games and uh, a little bit of our follow-up on close quarters combat even if you guys like what you're seeing please share this video don't forget to subscribe like let YouTube idiots know that this is stuff that you want to see and if you guys want a written version of this you can check it out over at outerheavenpaintball.blogspot.com I will put links in the description to this video as well as if you guys saw the last go around if I have to pirate from other YouTube channels I will put their names and links to their channels in the description to the video because I want to give credit where credit is due also if you guys need cool tactical swag or modifications for your paintball gun airsoft gun or your real steel firearms you need molly gear check out my friends over at acid tactical you can check them out at acidtactical.com and remember when a shit hits the fan and you've got to trust your gear with your life ask yourself this one question can your gear survive the acid test well anyway this is big boss and i'm out of here